Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center seminar. Uh, my name is Khaled Musallam. I am the peer director, and it's uh, my pleasure to introduce the speakers. Uh, this is uh, a two-month uh, anniversary of the April 16 Ecuador uh, earthquake that took place on a Saturday, and the team uh, that's about uh, to speak to us uh, have been there uh, very few days after the event. Uh, so it's one of the very early teams that arrived to the damaged sites, and uh, they will tell us uh, about their observation. So we have uh, three speakers uh, led by uh, Professor Eduardo Miranda from uh, Stanford University, uh, who's going to start uh, the presentation. Uh, and we have two PhD uh, students, uh, Luis uh, Rojas, from, also from Stanford University, and uh, Roberto Luco from uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, so without further ado, there will be uh, about one hour of presentation, uh, followed by roughly 20, 25 minutes of uh, question and answers. Uh, there will be opportunity for those who are online. I, I welcome all those who are online uh, to send emails to uh, peer underscore center at berkeley.edu uh, with the questions they have in mind, and we will relay that to the speakers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Halid. Well, first of all, it's really a pleasure to be back on campus. Uh, I studied here my graduate uh, studies many years ago, so it's always nice to come back to, to campus. Um, I'll, I'll start by, by thanking a number of people uh, that if you've done some of these reconnaissance, you know that it's actually it's impossible to do it by yourself, and you always rely on a number of people that will help you uh, carry out uh, your task. Um, let me just... My computer is definitely freezing. Okay, so I'll start by uh, thanking our earthquake center at Stanford, the John A. Bloom Earthquake Center, who provided uh, the funding for the Stanford side of our team to, to go in particular to the director, Greg Derling, and also to GEAR. Um, we teamed up with, with GEAR and we helped each other as, as we were there. In particular, we would like to thank uh, Professor John Bray, and the team leader of the GEAR uh, reconnaissance group, who was uh, Dr. Sisi Nicolau. And then uh, three professors from, um, from Ecuador, in particular Pedro Rojas from um, ESPOL, uh, Professor Javier Vera, who's actually a graduate from UC Berkeley, a, a former student of uh, John Bray and Juan Pestaña, and, uh, and finally Professor uh, Sergio Flores, who provided a lot of help while we were there, a lot of logistic uh, assistance. Uh, also, we'd like to thank the Instituto Geofisico of the uh, Escuela Politecnica Nacional, who is the Institute of Geophysics from their Polytechnical National uh, School over there, who not only installed the instruments, uh, but maintained the accelerograph network, uh, and we will be showing you some results, and they've asked us to, to include this in our presentation, and it's really without their help, uh, a lot of the learning that we will come from this earthquake would not be uh, possible. And uh, with that, I will just like to, you know, refer or put in perspective the earthquake with the one that we had here uh, on October 17, 1989. I, I was actually a student back then. Uh, I was not here on campus. I was just leaving Richmond Field Station. And, and you know basically what happened. Uh, but it's interesting to put the two earthquakes in perspective side by side. These are some of the consequences of that earthquake here in the Bay Area in terms of sort of the 3Ds that we talked about here uh, at Pier. And, uh, and then to contrast, and basically what we're going to be talking about, it's an earthquake much larger, 22 times larger, in a uh, country whose uh, gross domestic product per capita, it's about a tenth of that of the U.S. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll just uh, pass it on to, to just a few remarks. Uh, so the earthquake, as you know, had a magnitude of 7.8. Uh, on the subduction zone of, of Ecuador, right where that little uh, orange dot is it's located. And this is a map that was put together by the Institute of Geophysics uh, down there indicating some of the intensities. Uh, this in the European 
uh, scale, and then this one in the uh, instrumental intensity from uh, USGS. Um, so as you can see there, it affected really uh, widely felt throughout the country, but primarily affecting the west part of the country. And uh, the consequences are those that you see over there, uh, 60, 661 deaths, uh, about 30,000 injured, and also about the same number of displaced residents. And this is counted of the people that were sort of registered as a shelter. So there might be many more displaced residents that just moved to with friends and family. So now I'll pass it on to Roberto. Okay. Well, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, I'm going to talk about the seismicity at the tectonic setting of Ecuador and also about the ground motion observations and your technical aspects of the earthquake. But beforehand, I would like to thank uh, GEAR. Uh, it was a team effort, and all the team members helped to put these uh, slides together. So on the, on the right side, you have a picture that is pretty complicated, but it explains well what the subduction process in Ecuador looks like. At the left of that picture, you have the East Pacific rise, uh, the East Pacific rise which is a divergent plate, plate boundary. So cor cross is, crea is created uh, throughout the years there. And the Nazca plate moves uh, towards the east at an approximate rate of 60 millimeters per year. So, and further to the east, you have the Galapagos Island with the Galapagos hotspot. And that Galapagos hotspot, hotspot is very important because it's creating volcanoes and uh, mountains within the uh, oceanic slab. So now in the, in the coast of Ecuador, uh, you see the, uh, to, the, to your left, you see that uh, subducting slab where the Carnegie Ridge was formed by the Galapagos hotspot. And the slab is, uh, is three, three slabs uh, within the continent. Also, the subduction process has uh, created a transformed boundary plate within the country, which creates uh, crustal earthquakes as well. And we also have volcanism. So it's a country that has several uh, tectonic environments, and we're, we're mainly going to talk about the subduction process. So in the northern subduction zone of Ecuador, we had a six earthquakes in the past. 1906, the 8.8 uh, earthquake in, in January of 1906, uh, then 42, 58, and 79. And those earthquakes, if you see a literature, you will see that uh, the rupture of those three earthquakes together ruptured the same length as the 1906 earthquake. Then it came by de Caracas, uh, 7.2 magnitude, which had a lot of damage in that city, and now the 2016 Muisner earthquake. Now, to, to your left, you have the, the, the seismicity, the historical seismicity in, in the map of Ecuador, and you'll see that the subduction earthquakes, the 79, 58, 906, 42, and 98, all in the northern section of the subduction zone. And then you have now the 2016. And to the right, you have the latitude against time uh, plot of the earthquakes, and you can see also that the 79, 58, and 42 earthquakes together rupture about the same length as the 1906, on that, or that's at least what was believed be, uh, before 2014. In 2014, there's a nice paper where they were looking at the inter-seismic coupling of the subduction zone, and they said that uh, the asperity located between the 42 and 58 ruptures remains unbroken since the 1906 event, and a potential for a magnitude larger than 7.5 event in the next decades need to be considered there, as well as a potential tsunami. And this happened two years later, so it's pretty nice. Then this is uh, the finite fault rupture uh, from the USES. Uh, you can see the epicenter at a 20 kilometers depth, and it's propagating uh, towards the south. So you have a slip of around three, four meters maximum at the epicenter, and then three meters towards the south. Uh, the other thing here is that uh, the, finite, the, the, the dip of the rupture was about 16 degrees, so pretty shallow. Now, for seismic hazard analysis uh, in, in Ecuador, we usually consider crustal and subduction zones uh, earthquakes. And I'm putting the example of Manta and Porto Viejo, which are two cities that were damaged by the earthquake, and they're close together. 
So I'm showing you the PEA for 10% in 50 years is 0.71 for, uh, for month. And this is from Ivan Wong from URS. Um, and for Puerto Viejo, the, the Ecuadorian norm, uh, which is NEC 15, it's 0.65E. But for design, we use 0.5E. And that's because the, the, the code decided that everything that was above 0.5E, we're going to cap it to 0.5. It's like the deterministic uh, here where, where you do the deterministic cap. Here we use a more arbitrary cap, but it's just 0.5. And then the other thing is for hazard analysis, we have to see that there's a lot, a lot of variability in the source characterization linked to a great deal of variability. For a given PEA, you, you can have an order of magnitude of the annual rate of exceedance. Now I'm going to talk about the recorded, uh, recorded motions. Uh, and I have to thank, again, the uh, Geophysical Institute. They were great. They gave us, uh, it was hard to get it, but mainly because they had to deploy a lot of people to the stations and they gave it, uh, gave it uh, uh, to us. Uh, so they had, uh, we were given 30 records and we used 29. And they were, those were processed uh, by the peer standard. Actually, Tadahiro, who is here, helped us doing that. And then the largest recorded motion was in Perinales, uh, the station that was closest to the epicenter and to a rupture with 1.4 G. So here I have overlay, uh, I overlaid the intensity maps from USES with the recorded motion from the stations uh, classified by intensity from the PEA. So the red dots is squared than 0.3, and then the yellow dots are between 0.1 and 0.3, and the Green is 0.1 to 0.05, and blue is less than 0.05. So you can start seeing some trends here. For example, the red dots, uh, Manta, Puerto Viejo, and Chone, towards the south of the rupture, uh, had more intensity than the three yellow dots at the north, even though the, 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 rupture is, the, the distance to a rupture is pretty much the same. Obviously, uh, two stations in Pernales where the, where the highest motions were recorded. And then in Guayaquil, down uh, to the south, you see uh, side effects going on, which is uh, because the city is located on uh, soft deposits. And from, from these stations, I have selected eight of them to show you time histories. And the reason, well, I, I've shown the Pernales, the two stations, because they were the largest one. And also show, showing Chone, Mantan, and Puerto Viejo, which are the largest one towards the south. And I'm also showing that AV21 because it's really close uh, to a rupture in, in the same way as Chone, but has less intense motions. And then Guayaquil because you can see uh, clearly a side effects from 0.02G to, to 0.1G. Uh, the other thing you can see between Chone, Manta, and Puerto Viejo is the frequency content. For, for example, for Puerto Viejo and Manta, you can see high frequencies, whereas Chone has a, a more long period motion. Uh, and it's probably because of side effects. Here is uh, the acceleration, velocity, and displacement time history from uh, the Pernal station. And you can see the 1.4 G is a very high frequency spike. Uh, and the response spectra compared to the code. So you can see that uh, that was well above the code. And mainly it's because of that cap that the code uses for, for 0.5 E. Now here what I have done is I, I was comparing the, uh, the recorded motions to the GMP from Abrahamson et al., uh, also known as PC Hydro. And I was calculating inter-event residuals uh, or between-event residuals for periods of 0 0.2, 1, and 3 seconds. So what this is telling us is that for uh, sh shorter periods, the, the median uh, values of the recorded motions were almost one standard deviation below the median from other subduction earthquakes. Whereas for long periods, uh, this, this earthquake had motions that are, were in agreement with the median. And I'm going to show you the inter-event, uh, the between-event receivables for this earthquake compared to other earthquakes here. So for example, the, all the, the, the dots, the, the black dots, uh, are uh, other earthquakes from subduction earthquakes that were used for the regression for the, for the GMP. And the yellow dot e, and, and purple dot is Japan earthquake. The green dot is Chile earthquake. And the red dot is uh, Ecuador earthquake for PEA only. If we go to lower periods, we will see that Ecuador will be in the line of zero residuals. 
Now, there's, this is a more direct comparison to, to the spectra from the GMP, and you can see that Pernales was almost one standard deviation above the median for both uh, stations. Then Manta was well above the median, uh, the, the one standard deviation median. Uh, Porto Viejo and Chone were in some periods above the one standard deviation. And here some interesting thing is, for example, at three second periods, Manta, Porto Viejo and Chone show a, a, a bump in the spectra, indicating that maybe side effects, uh, directivity effects are present, or maybe even path effects. We don't know yet. Uh, maybe aftershocks will indicate if it is path effect or, or directivity effects. Then the AV21 I'm showing it because uh, it's really close to the rupture the same way as Chone is, but the motion is uh, much less, and it's because it's located at the north, uh, probably. So, in, and the two, the last two, I'm showing Guayaquil stations because uh, from the rock at a BS area of 1,000 meters per second to BS area of 100 meters per second, there's a lot of an amplification. Lastly, I want to talk about the code. I'm comparing the same motions, the geomean spectra to the code, and you can see that Pernales, uh, almost Pernales, it's well above the code. Manta is right there with the code with the 475 year return period. And then Porto Viejo is uh, a little bit lower at most of the period, but it, it has a, a clear peak at 0.4 seconds. And then Chone has a clear peak also at 1.5 to 2 seconds. And Guayaquil, I'm showing because the, 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 this is soil type F, so we shouldn't be using a code for that, but side response analysis. So there's uh, two groups that have done a specific city spectra for those, and the shape is pretty good to, to what was recorded, but intensity is way off because it was far away. I'm going to talk about the geotechnical aspect of the earthquake. So I'm going to start with liquefaction, the, the subject of my thesis. Uh, this is a bridge in Manta. It was on piers, but there we observed liquefaction, and there's a 90 centimeter sand boil there. And in the lower right picture, uh, I measured like 25 centimeters of settlement respect to the pile foundation, uh, pile founded building. The building was fine. It behaved well. But we saw a lot of this in, uh, throughout the earthquake. Uh, this is the Mejia Bridge, and I, in the next slide, I'm going to show you four pictures, uh, one for each abutment, and three of those, uh, the, the abutment one, two, and three failed, and the fourth, uh, nothing happened. And then I'm showing you some pictures from the drone, which are pretty cool, and I'm going to show you some geotech data where, that we already have there. So this is number one, is this, uh, to a lower right. Uh, it, it displays laterally like one meter, then the second one displaced laterally like two meters. The third one, you see how the retaining wall fell because of lateral spraying, and the fourth, nothing happened. And now for the uh, third one, I'm going to show you two, two more pictures from the drone. So you can see the massive movement of Earth that happened there. This is another picture. And we have some data there, and uh, actually uh, Javier Vera from her studios and, uh, provided me with this data, and he, he, I calculated factor of safety of liquefaction from the CPT and SPT, and it shows between uh, 7 to 14 meters there's liquefaction there. Now, this is an interesting case history in Tarkin, the sector of Tarkin, Manta, where uh, there was a lot of damage. And uh, this is a Google Street view of, of, the, of, of these houses before the earthquake. You can see that the house to the left is like five centimeters above uh, the other house. And then this is what happened in the earthquake. So it's pretty much like 40 or 50 centimeters of punching of the house into the ground. And we don't know the type of foundation, but we are guessing it's like a spread footings or, or isolated footings, but with a tie beam. And then this is within the house. You can see a floor, how it's uplifted, and, and, and also the sidewalks in the same. So it's a punching failure. It's like a, a bring capacity type of failure. But there was no sun injector, so we don't know if it's liquefaction or maybe some. Now, this is the same type of uh, damage. To the left is Google Street View. To the right is what was taken after the earthquake. And the picture to the top left tells you that the water table is low. I mean, this was, in, uh, this was taken in March 2015, 
the Google Street View photo, and it's the raining season, and you can see a the water there. It's like it's flowing a little bit the, the street. Uh, and to the right, you can see a building punch a little bit. But more uh, the, the building to a, a to the bottom, it's 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 worse because you can see the the sidewalk is sloping towards the street to the left, and in the other picture, it's sloping towards the building. So it it, it, it clearly punched the ground. Then this is a slope stability failure that happened in Porto Viejo. The bridge is fine. This is Google Street View map. And you can see a shape of the slope. And that shape goes uh, below the bridge, too, where there's four piles that are embedded into that slope and that you will see next. So that's the slope failure uh, in the picture above and, and to the right. And then those are the piles that I was talking about. Though all the ground that was there moved towards the, ri towards the river. But the, the bridge was fine. It didn't happen. It was functional. Nothing happened to the bridge. This is Bridge Las Chakras. This is, uh, it was almost like four meters crack uh, there. It, that dis vertical displacement was like three meters from the right side and like one meter from the other part of the street. And the cracks go like 800 meters long. So it's a big crack. The bridge that is nearby uh, didn't suffer at all. It's just the abutments that fell. This is another, we did shear wave velocity measurements there. A uh, gear team did uh, shear wave uh, velocity measurements. And there's this is pictures from the drone again from that, uh, from that same uh, bridge, Las Chakra Bridge. So you can see the big uh, cracks in there. And then this is a slope stability problem that Professor Miranda uh, spotted it near Hama. And then he spotted like four feet, like almost one meter, 1.5 meters of a settlement, uh, six, uh, six feet, so two meters of settlements in the top of the slope. And this is what is basically happening, a slope stability failure. And, and in the bottom, you can see, a, you should see some type of soil coming up. And this is what Professor Miranda found there. So these slopes are important because I was, we were driving a Highway E15 towards the north, so towards the epicenter, and I was taking pictures of the slopes. And I was thinking maybe as I go towards the epicenter, I will find more damage. But nothing happened. They behave really well, and it's a 45 degree slopes. So it's, it, it was good behavior of slopes in, in general. This was a big landslide in that highway, and they had to put a... a, a a provisional street to, to the cars that wanted to pass towards the north. Now, this is interesting because they always say that liquefaction is more, it's important in rivers, near, near, uh, near beaches, in, in fluvial environments. So I, I was asked by a friend to go to visit one dam in helicopter. So the, the, the driver, <laughs> or he took me along the river. So I was taking pictures of that, and it's clear how you see more ejecta near the river systematically. So it's not important here because you don't see any structures, but in case you have a structure with liquefiable soil near a river, you have to be really careful, and this happens. This is a landslide near Highway E15, and it was big. Like the three, the three pictures there is just show the landslide, and the, the other one, the red dot in there, it's just showing a drone because uh, it was far away. So someone took the drone and took some pictures, and those are the nice pictures. You can see a slide pretty well. Now, in analysis, remember 1.4G in, in for geotech stuff, there was not much to see more than the, the, the pipes, uh, the backfill of the pipe fell. It was bad backfill and it settled. <coughs> so it's important, but uh, it's nothing uh, to, to, not too much damage uh, to geotech, geotech related damage. This is uh, the Valle Caracas, Los Caras Bridge. It's an isolated bridge, two kilometers long. And Professor Miranda is going to talk about that. But I was pretty interested because I was involved in the project before uh, I did my undergrad project on that bridge. And there was a lot of liquefiable soils there. And, but the bridge behaved well. It was, uh, it was there be, uh, after the earthquake functional. It has some settlements. We don't know yet how much. It had some lateral displacement. We don't know yet how much. But, uh, it, ha but it behaved well. It was functional after the earthquake. So it was eight or nine piles, depending on the pier. And then, uh, well, the, the structure is going to be explained, I think, by Professor Miranda, but it has isolations bef uh, be below the deck. 
And then uh, for this reach, I'm going to show you uh, four pictures. Uh, the first picture is from the 1998 earthquake where we spot liquefaction one kilometer away. And then the other pictures are from this earthquake. I, I took pictures of liquefaction uh, uh, to the south, 800, 800 meters below the, the bridge, and just right by the bridge. So the, the top left is the 1998 picture showing clear liquefaction. The, the other two, the, the, the top right picture is the photo I took from the helicopter, clear liquefaction. And it, this is the same environment. So we expect liquefaction to happen in that river. And they, this is below the abutment in San Vicente, uh, where they told me they installed drains for liquefaction mitigation. Apparently, they worked, and you can see there. So and this is one of the soundings that we got from the project, and this is like a relative density of 50% based on SPT and factor of safety well below 1 until 22 meters. Now, the Earth uh, dance performance uh, was good in general. Posa Anda and La Esperanza Dam behaved uh, uh, really well. No, not much damage happened. And the Chone, Chone Dam, uh, the core of the dam was fine, but they had some uh, stability problems in the right abutment, which are shown here. So that, that was one of the damage we observed in, in dams. And last, I'm going to talk about the Port of Manta, which is one of the most interesting cases uh, related to, soil, uh, to your technical aspects. So first picture I'm going to show you next is going to be the south uh, parking lot it would have a widespread liquefaction. And then I'm going to show you pictures from the port itself, where we have a one boring hole and one CPT. So this is the parking lot, a lot of liquefaction, a lot of sun injecta, and the gear team took VS measurements here. And this is the port itself, where you can see vertical displacement as well as lateral displacement. The picture to the lower left show some of the piles that were vertical, how they were displaced laterally without any load at all, um, and also the cracks within the embankment of the port. And here is the SPT and CPT giving very similar results in terms of factor of safety, but the CPT has a little bit, a little bit lower factor of safety uh, between 6 and 8 meters. So with that, I pass it to... Okay. Uh, I'm going to explain to you which is the trip we, we took in Ecuador, how we uh, started with the cities near the epicenter and we were farther uh, away from it. So the first, well, you see here in this picture where the epicenter took place and how the cities that were close uh, to, to the epicenter are. So I'm gonna start with Pernales city. This is Pernales, just 22 miles away from the epicenter, high PGA values in the horizontal direction, also in the vertical direction. If we see what's a, a view of Pernales before the earthquake, we actually see this picture over here. There are a bunch of uh, reinforced concrete constructions with infills and a lot of wooden constructions. Remember this picture and now see the other picture. This is how it looks like, uh, it looked like af after the earthquake. Uh, in most of the most damaged uh, blocks, we saw kind of a 30% of houses uh, collapsing. And this uh, stadium over here, which is the stadium, a soccer stadium in Pernales, was used as the emergency response center. Uh, a lot of things were going on here. They were uh, actually having certain uh, hospital, te temporary hospital facility here. In the next pictures here, we can see how the international aid was in this uh, respo uh, response center. This is, uh, if I'm seeing correctly, this is the Red Cross from Colombia. But, and also we can see here the uh, Doctors Without Borders over here. This is, another, this is a bus that is for, from the Ecuador government, and it was helping also with response. And with that, um, we're going to see now some more structural damage. This is a view of one building before the earthquake. This is in downtown Pernales. And afterwards, it looked like this. So it was like a total collapse uh, mechanism in the second story. And if we look more close to this picture, we're going to see here how the details of the, of the failed homes are. Let's look even closer. Here we see a good, or this might be a number three river in the stirrups, space each four inches. The concrete we can like, classify it from the picture as like regular. But still, we can see some of the hooks here uh, in 90 degrees rather than in 135. 
And this is another view of a, a soft story collapse. This is a, 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 also a picture in Pernales. And like this, we, can, we saw a, a bunch of them. So this is just a collection of the pictures we saw there. But still, like this was a neighboring house from, it was just very close from all the other uh, collapsed houses we saw. And this behaved particularly well. So it's very surprising to find these huge varieties in close distances. And even if we see the, gla the, uh, the, glaci the glass here, we see that there is no sign of damage from the airway in this city. Mm -hmm. And this is very impressive. We saw also an ATC20-like tagging process. This tag process was uh, occurred three days after the earthquake. And obviously, since this building wasn't damaged, uh, was not damaged, they ordered uh, that the occupancy was was allowed. Allowed. And since we're going to see a lot of uh, infill wall failures, I wanted to show you this uh, cartoon over here to show you how how these uh, infill walls fail. So we have here an, an a form shape of an infill an infill wall under a uh, reinforced concrete frame. Here, if we impose certain lateral deformation to this wall, we're going to have a, a diagonal in the infill that's going to carry certain compression. That's the Y line, the Y arrow over there. But in the other direction, we're going to experiment certain tension, and that's going to lead to a crack in the wall. But since earthquakes are ci cyclic, we're going to have the same thing in the other direction. And finally, we're going to have an X kind of failure over here. And if that's combined with certain out-of-plane movement, movement of the wall, we're going to we kind of have this out of plane failure that we're going to actually see uh, in real life how, how they are. And this is a picture of how, how they are. So this is what I was describing in cartoons, but in real life. And we found like that some other uh, failures. We see here that there is no beam at the, uh, at the top. So this is a U-shaped failure of the infill wall. And we also saw a bunch of uh, small hotels in Pedernales, since this is very touristic. Uh, that failed. Actually, one kid was rescued from here uh, after the airway. The kid was left here by their parents. The parents were, were in the beach, but happily he, he was rescued uh, safely. We can see some pictures over here. This is a, a view of how the contents in, the, in this uh, small hotel uh, support certain or carry certain load. In this case, this is kind of supporting the load of the slab. So this uh, remind us that uh, the triangle of life can be very well can save lives actually. This is a view of a school in uh, in Pernales. This is just a front view. We can see here the back of the school, and if we take a close view, we can see the, the typical uh, short column mechanism. Here is a shear failure in the in the column over here, but if we take a close view, we can see that the river, uh, the stirrups are fairly, uh, well, the, those are good detailing in space, uh, and spacing of four inches. This might be a number three river, and the hooks are, are fairly okay. It's a 135 hook angle. And well, you see in a close view, this is some of the damage we think, well, inside the school, the, the parapets fall down. We can see also that some shear failures in the column over here. And still, we can see a good detail of the, of the stirrups. This is a view of how the walls fall inside the, the classroom. So actually, this earthquake happened or occurred uh, at 6 p.m. at 6 p.m. on Saturday. But if it were to occur uh, on a on a Monday where students are here, this may be very dangerous for, for the students since we see a lot of the debris fall in the, in the desks. Here we see a classical view of a collapse mechanism. If we take a close view to, to the plastic hinges, we can see some of the details of this, some, the, compression, the compression part and the tension part in the plastic hinge, so it's like a, a, a good picture for a book. And that was the damage in Pernales. This is the damage in Hama. We're getting far away from the epicenter. This was 46 miles away from the epicenter over here. And we see, we saw here this school. Uh, well, let's let's take a look at this picture over here. We see that the infill wall is damaged, but still the column is fairly okay. So we we see that the the infill is damaged as a result of interaction with the column, but happily. The column was fairly strong, so that it, it didn't receive that much damage. But in the back of the of this school, we see that there is a, uh, a failure of the slab that was uh, over the, the ladder. That may be very dangerous for, for kids. 
And also we saw a bunch of different houses, wooden houses, a precarious wood house. Uh, but it's, it's surprising though that beside, that it's next to this school that it's reinforced concrete, that this uh, wooden house is just standing there with not visible sign of major, of major damage. So if we, we're very interested in, in looking at what details uh, kept this uh, building alive. And we were surprised that there is, if we see the connections here, there is no nails. And we can see some other connections. We don't see any nail over here. And it, well, this is a detail of how the, how the slab looked like. And also, well, we saw behind of, the, of this building that there was a partial collapse of the slab over here. But it allows us to show certain detailing of how the connections are finally look like. So it's kind of a shear lock over there that allows to transfer some load from the beam to the column. So that might have been the reason why this uh, performed kind of okay. And also we saw some other interesting examples of two, well, this is one old house, precarious wooden construction that was kind of undamaged. We saw that undamaged, but the neighbor was looked like this. So these things are very interesting to see since we, we actually uh, are still wondering why one failed and the other one was okay. And well, with this, I'm gonna pass on Professor Miranda. So this is a, a very interesting structure, uh, perhaps one of the most important bridges in the country uh, that was built relatively recently over the Chone River, uh, two kilometers long, as you see in the slide. And, um, and it's uh, base isolated, as Roberto uh, mentioned. Uh, it was built by the Army Corps of Engineers of, of Ecuador. Uh, there you see uh, part of a nice uh, display that they have on, on the southern end of the, of the bridge. And uh, this is a photograph of the bridge. And uh, basically it has a series of supports, as you can see here, supported on four legs. And that in turn is, is supported by, by piles on the river. And uh, this is a lateral view, a close-up view, so you get a, a feel of, of the scale. And uh, you basically have simply supported uh, precast beams, and there you see the isolators. So on each one of these uh, four legs, there are four isolators on top. Uh, this is a plan and an elevation view of those supports. Again, four uh, friction pendulum system bearings. And uh, this is some details of these bearings. They're second generation bearings, not, not the triple pendulum that we are using more recently here in the United States. Um, these have two sliding surfaces uh, with a slider and uh, with 30 centimeters displacement capacity on the two surface for a total of 60. And these are some photographs of those. In general, there was uh, really excellent behavior uh, and it's a great success story. This is one of the, in the southern end, one of the supports, a very large support in which on the right it's fixed based and on the left it's seismically isolated. So even though we don't see it here, there's a couple of uh, isolation bearings on the left side. Uh, this is a, a very nice, similar to the New Bay Bridge here. It has, a, you can walk along one side of the bridge and use your bike to cross the river. And this is one of the seismic joints on the south end um, that, again, behaved very well, very well uh, detailed. There was a lot of evidence of the relative motion that took place there. And uh, we tried to carefully uh, document the displacement that we saw, in this case, uh, 20 centimeters, 8 inches, that that uh, cover plate was moved. And uh, on the other end, it actually ran into a bolt, as you see there, that caused local buckling of the cover plate. And this is actually inside, where there's more evidence of that relative motion that, you, that took place of some of the electrical wiring uh, scratching against that cover. Uh, this is one of the typical segments, 180 uh, meter segments, uh, in which they have uh, uh, thermal or, or, or small seismic joints at every 180 uh, meters. And I'll show you some details of that. 
And uh, so here I'll show you some details of some of those joints because the joints are relatively small. And my impression is that probably uh, the designers thought that they would move uh, pretty uniform. There would be no multiple support excitation that would move asynchronous. Uh, but we actually documented a number of instances of some pounding. Uh, but probably the motion in this uh, inside joints was not very large. Actually, uh, because of the electrical wiring, that was probably not very well detailed. But that allows us to see, uh, of course, the earthquake cut some of the PVC piping, but that allows us to measure some of the relative displacement in some of these supports. And here's an example of that where we were able to measure uh, 4.5 centimeters, 1.8 inches in one of these. In, in a few of these, there was uh, failure of the seals. And in some, we documented some uh, small residual displacements. These are estimated. Uh, because it's not, there's not an easy way to actually get to the isolator. So this is just taken by a, from a very powerful telephoto from a long distance away. And uh, this is just sort of from underneath the, the bridge. You see the two uh, kilometer long bridge. And uh, this is on the southern part, uh, the fixed base part. It's curb or sort of the ramp to get into the base isolated. Uh, I show you previously this, this support, a photograph of that. So now in this case, on the left, it's fixed based. On the right, it's base isolated. And uh, in general, this fixed base part behaved fairly well, although there was some damage that I'll show you here. So there you see that some photographs, overall photographs of the curbs. And that's the kind of uh, damage that we observe pretty much on, all, uh, on both ends of all of these uh, bends. Okay, so I'll pass it on now back to Luis. Okay, I'm here again. So, well, we, we kept going south, and this is, uh, we also uh, were, were in Bahia de Caracas, that was 75 miles away from the epicenter. And if we see, which is a, like a view of the city, we see a lot of, a tall building is a very beautiful place. And this is what we found in Bahia de Caracas. This is a view of the museum and how it looked like after the earthquake. We see a lot of damage in the facade. Let's look closely. Yeah, we, he we here see also a uh, damage in this uh, non-structural element. Similarly here in the walls, we see some damage. And this is an interesting view of the fire station of, of Bahia de Caracas. Uh, if we look closely to the door, we see her here that, well, it's, it's not possible to see it here, but actually, oh, let me show you this. Let me tell you what it happened here. Uh, here, actually, the door couldn't be opened after the earthquake. So due to the drift in the, in the structure, uh, the fire station were obviously these, the, the, these big trucks that are going to uh, be able to help people weren't able to go out of this fire station. So this, this damage, even though it seems to be uh, unnoticeable, it was very important for, for this fire station. And this is where the temporary location of the fire station uh, was. Uh, if we see here, we see all the equipment, the radios, and even the generator, the electric generator here. And this is another view of another building. Uh, we see also a bunch of uh, a, a structural damage here of a coupling girder. And it's interesting to see that, the, well, this happened uh, in Ecuador two months ago, but actually the same uh, type of failure we saw it in, in Alaska uh, a few decades ago. So there are still things to learn. Uh, we see a bunch also of different uh, damage in the facade, even the, 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 the glass. Uh, this is another view of a, another, another building. Still, we see the same kind of damage, even though the structure, the structure seemed okay. A lot of non-structural uh, damage occurred. And the same happened. This is another view of, the, of this building. And still, we have damage in the, in the, in the glass. Similarly, in other, in other uh, floors. Another, another building. Here in this building, we see an incipient uh, 
punching shear failure. We see the, the cracks surrounding the, what it is, a column there. This is another view of another uh, building, a tall building. Still a lot of damage in the, in the non-structural components, gla glass and, and the partition walls, well, these uh, walls of the facade. Another view of this. Here we see also the, the same thing, an incipient uh, punching shear failure. And more, more damage in the, in the first story. And with that, we're going to pass on, on uh, Puerto Viejo. It's a, a large city. 280k inhabitants over here. PJ is still a bit large, almost 0.4 Gs, uh, 100 miles away from the epicenter. And this is the, the a university there, uh, the Universidad Técnica de Manaví. Uh, here we see a, a, a building within the university that looks okay, that looked okay. But if we walk just a few meters away from it, we see uh, we saw this uh, building that was that had a lot of damage. Uh, we can see here that the infield, that the bridge from the from the walls fall where the sidewalks are. So this might be very dangerous for for students. And here we see also shear failure of the of the of the column as a result of the interaction with this infield wall. You can see that the the detailing of the of the um, of the column. We see that there is a double a diamond stirrup over there. So this is a it should be resisting a lot of shear. And even though uh, that, even though this uh, it had this amount of reinforcement, it failed in shear. That's very impressive. A lot also of out of plane failures of in field walls. Uh, we can see this in this building over here in the university. And if we move to the downtown Puerto Viejo, we see here a, a picture of a tall, what kind of a tall building or a medium rise building. Uh, that is a bit old, but this is how it looked like before the earthquake and how it looked like after the earthquake. Uh, we can see here some, like what we might think, it's the start of the collapse, uh, a loss of load, uh, vertical carrying capacity of, of the column. We might, I ha we have here a close view of this, even a closer view over this, and we see the column completely smashed. It doesn't have any actual capacity. And now this is a view of another, another building in Puerto Viejo. Still, we can see the details of the river, and it looks a good spacing in the, in the, in the joints. It's another view of another uh, building before the earthquake and after the earthquake, a soft story mechanism in the first floor. Similarly, this building, and this, is, this case is, is very interesting. We see one building in the left that it's, it's a, it was kind of okay. It's standing there, but the other building, reinforced concrete building, is completely, uh, it completely collapsed. We can see some detailing of, of, of the column of the, of the building that was in the left. Uh, also, this is, uh, these are another houses in, in Puerto Viejo. Uh, we see that it, it also collapsed. Similarly, we see here uh, another building that also was completely collapsed. And like that, we had we had some other examples. This is another building that collapsed of story mechanism, first floor. This building with huge cantilevers also performed <laughs> poorly. We see here also another building that well, this, this, it's also impressive to, to show this. We, we don't uh, only learn from the buildings that collapse, but also from the buildings that uh, behave well. So this, this building, even though it had huge uh, cantilevers in the front, in both, in both sides, it performed well, it, it, it didn't collapse. And the same happened with this building. We see a detail of the beams. We suggest that they have deep beams in one direction, but in the other one, they might have just a, a beams that are in, a, within the slab. And this is the response center, EQ in 911 response center of in Ecuador. Some a view of well, the arrows, in, the arrows indicating where where some damage in the facade occurred. And this is a view of the electrical generator room of the of this uh, institution. Some it's a view or like evidence of some sliding of this uh, of this equipment during the earthquake. And this is a view of the counterweight in the in the elevator and the and the rails that are so well, the rails uh, of the of the counterweight. And then this is a Manta City. Uh, this, this city is 100 miles away from the epicenter. 
uh, the PGAs are still large, about 0.5 Gs. And this is the port of Manda. I'm going to pass on Professor Miranda now again. So Ecuador has uh, three major ports. This one of them, another one in Esmeraldas in the north, and then in the city of Guayaquil, which is the largest city in the country. Um, as you can see, this one has a breakwater on the right and then two large uh, wharves, uh, all of which sustain uh, quite a bit of damage, as we will see. These are just some photographs we downloaded from the Internet just to get you an idea of this. Uh, they call them international wharves. And this is that um, yard that, that Roberto showed uh, before, that liquefaction. Um, this is actually the main entrance of import of, of cars from all over the world. And, um, and that liquefaction took there. Actually, with, with quite a bit of, of, uh, of plasticity, and usually when we have fines, it's harder to liquefy the soil. But still, with the presence of those fines, uh, liquefied massively. Uh, and these are some of the lateral spreading and, and um, settlements that took place associated with this failure in the yards. This is a small yacht club uh, for the launching and, and getting the, the boats in the water uh, that have massive failures, as you can see there in the ramp. And uh, this is one of the uh, maintenance and operation of the port buildings that it's uh, on piles on on the uh, right next to to fills, which, as you can see there, uh, had very large settlements as a result of the uh, liquefaction. And this is looking at the same building from the water side, um, where some of these piles had been retrofitted in large sections, uh, but for some reason they left a portion up on the top uh, where some plastic hinge took place and some shear failures. Uh, coming now to the, some of the structural aspects of the wharfs, um, I'll show you some of the failures that we observed. We, they were kind enough to, to uh, take us by boat, and they spent a lot of time. Uh, we were very grateful uh, in explaining and showing us everything that happened there. Usually the way this, this wharfs are designed are uh, you have a lot of vertical piles that support the gravity load, and then you primarily take um, the, the seismic through these batter piles, um, which in this case, they're located on the two sides of the wharf. And, uh, but in this case, just as I'll show you, the actual shear failure took place on this so-called gravity system. Uh, but of course, the earthquake recognizes that they're also going to be taking lateral loadings, the same lateral deformation. So they, they failed, as you see here in the photograph. And these are some of the, the failures on the batter piles that we observed, uh, in some cases a little bit more uh, flexurally dominated, plastic hinging, in other cases shear failures. This is under the wharf, some of the verticals, and on the right you see some of the batter piles. This had been uh, retrofitted actually by a U.S. Uh, design and construction firm that they do work, this kind of work uh, all over the world. And um, despite of that work, it, it had uh, a number of problems. One of which they added some additional piles to increase the vertical capacity of the wharfs. And some of these didn't have, they were connected to the main beams through this uh, elements that didn't have enough uh, shear capacity and they all failed as shown here. And on the marginal wharf, um, on the top, you would see this sort of unusual deformation. There's a close-up view there. And uh, on the top, you would see, again, massive settlements, as shown here. And this is underneath of this, um, primarily on one of the segments. This is actually a very long, if I recall correctly, 800-meter marginal wharf. And uh, in one of the segments, about 200 meters long, it had uh, some failures on the batter piles that I'll show you as a result of the failure of the uh, of the soil, uh, possibly from uh, liquefaction. I'll show you here a close-up view of those and and some other photographs 
of a failure. So typically, this these piles will be uh, pre-stressed, precast piles, and then uh, they're connected to the to the slab uh, through some mild reinforcement that, in this case, didn't have enough uh, shear capacity to uh, sustain the very large forces that took place. And over 200 meters, pretty much all of them uh, failed, especially in one direction. Uh, but the beam was actually fairly generous in redistributing some of these loads. And despite the relatively large vertical displacement, it was still able to redistribute and avoid the total collapse of the structure. Here are some uh, more images of the port and the uh, lateral spreading and liquefaction. This is in one of the uh, approximations to one of the wharfs. And then this is the breakwater where, again, uh, lateral spreading took place. Now, this is the International Airport in Manta. Uh, relatively small, has about five or six uh, flights a day. And uh, the main problem there was their control tower. You may have seen this in the news. And uh, fortunately, a lot of the radar and equipment that they used to operate, it was in another building that sustained some damage. Uh, and there were two operators at the time of the earthquake, one of which was able to make it out, I don't ask me why, uh, and, or how was able to, to escape from the collapse. Uh, just imagine being in the control tower during the earthquake. And this is the, in the inside of the terminal. A lot of damage to info walls, uh, but also some structural damage uh, here. Very complicated failures. Sometimes we we think that the short, pal uh, short column failures would only occur if you leave a certain segment that it's on restraint. But actually, even if you have a complete infill, uh, you lose from compression a portion of that infill. And then afterwards, you generate the short column. And this is what happened uh, there. Uh, more of the inside of the airport. And this is um, one of several hospitals that we visited, again, in, in the city of Manta. This is the ES, which is their, their major uh, social security system for health care in the country. And this is a five-story uh, building, Rainforest Concrete Frames, uh, which, as you will see, it actually f did fairly well structurally, uh, but one of the worst structures that I've ever seen when it comes to non-structural. And I'll show you, I'll walk you very fast through those so you get an, an idea of what the patients, the, the, the staff, the doctors that were inside this hospital went through. This is actually the, um, let me back, that, that's the emergency exit uh, that you would transfer. Sort of the path would be from the stairs inside the tower and then you would go into the building and then you would have to do like a U-turn here and then walk out. But a lot of the infills fell to the exterior. So there was no way that you could use some of these uh, stairs. But fortunately, that other stair that I show you on, the, on one end of the building allowed the patients to uh, be evacuated. These are more problems with, with infills. And so this here, we're just going around the building from the outside, and now I'll show you a little bit of the inside. At one point, I, I was counting, sort of just observing the beds and the amount of infills on top of the beds, and it was just very sad to, to see uh, what went on. This is one of the main corridors inside. This is pediatrics, so you can imagine the kids that were on the, those beds. This is one level up, the main corridor. So imagine if you needed to use that corridor to exit the, the uh, building. And interestingly enough, this is one level up, same building. And, and if you think about uh, acceleration demands, and you would say, well, you know, I can sort of explain that there would be more drift in the lower levels. 
but acceleration demands usually increase with height and sort of the same kind of ceilings and light fixtures and everything that were in the lower levels. I mean, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing here. And uh, so we went up there and we took some more photographs. This is of the stairs, but now looking down, uh, obviously you could not see this. And what was more interesting to me in this, in this hospital was that I was really looking for evidence of structural damage. And I'll show you the little that I could find. I'll, I'll point to some of the close-ups. And uh, this is all I could find in terms of structural damage in, in the whole hospital. So my estimate is, is that this hospital only saw about 1 or maybe 1.2% drift. Uh, but you can imagine what would have been if it would have gone through the 2% that we allowed by the codes, which is the same value that they allowed in Ecuador. It was clearly, we saw a lot of evidence of cases where, you know, just the estimation of lateral displacement, similar to U.S. practice, we give secondary importance to displacements, and, and clearly that causes lots of problems, not only in non-structural components, but pounding, uh, here's another example of pounding and, uh, and then the consequences that that leads. In this case, uh, the pounding led to the failure of the infill and eventually that to the failure of the column. And uh, more problems with infills, those X's that Luis referred to. And uh, this was a, a almost brand new, very fancy architecture, very fancy building in downtown Manta. Uh, where you would expect, you know, a lot of engineering, much better level of engineering in, in both structural and non-structural components, had a couple of bridges connecting the two towers. I would say relatively well detailed structurally or sort of thinking in terms of the gap uh, between them, but it was clearly not enough. There was pounding, as we're showing here, uh, in the upper uh, bridge, but also on the lower bridge. Uh, but I was surprised that even though there was all this care in terms of structural and detailing of the seismic joint there, uh, there was not sort of the corresponding details in the non-structural component. If you notice the pattern on the glazing, one of the glazing panels was right on the joint. So, I mean, it's like, wow, there's something wrong in this picture. Again, lots of problems with infills, sort of disasters waiting to happen and disasters after. Uh, lots of soft stories, very clear uh, side effects in the city of, of Manta again, in particular in a neighborhood of, of Tarqui that Roberto referred to. Uh, we documented many hotels and structures similar to this with soft story collapses. And this is the same building, actually had a a number of different bodies, and uh, I just wanted to point out how complicated uh, it is to deal with these infills. Actually, uh, here at Berkeley, Professor Monsalam is an expert on infills, has done a lot of research with his students on this. It's very complex to model them and predict what they're going to do. So this is another example of how the failure of one of these, if you crush it, uh, locally, you end up failing your column, even if you have very good detail. So, so this is, you know, very similar type of details that maybe we would have here in the U.S. Still, it failed. Uh, and it was originally not sort of like a short column that you would n recognize from the architectural drawings. Um, something very interesting that I noticed in Ecuador, th there's a lot of art on their bridges. Uh, in lots of cities, especially in the city of Guayaquil, uh, beautifully decorated all the piers and bends. And I'll just show you very quickly some of the damage on, on these bridges. In general, they behave fairly well. Uh, unlike Chile, where they experienced lots of problems with, with bridges, I would say that overall in, in Ecuador, the engineers did an excellent job, uh, especially if you consider the, the very large magnitude of the event. Uh, still, some of these things you know, they, they can post a lot of problems uh, for, for people passing by. This happened to be right on top of the uh, bike path. And uh, same damage was pretty much uh, on all bends on both sides. More examples of the damage in Manta. And uh, this is just a reflection 
of how tough when we're doing uh, rapid evaluations here in the United States, we have a number of uh, methodologies that have been developed. And I noticed this to uh, hotels right next to each other, sort of same site conditions, same number of stories, same structural system. One, very good shape as you see here. Uh, this is another angle of the same one. And literally across the street, this other, it, it had major damage. So, so probably if you were doing the, you know, rapid evaluation of some type, you would say, well, you know, they would expect to have the same performance. It just tells us of how tough it is to actually predict ahead of time what may actually happen in an earthquake. Uh, this is another example in, in Turkey. It's actually a, a neighboring structure. And I just wanted to illustrate sometimes Things that, you know, we think, oh, well, this is non-ductile rainforest concrete, has very small rotation capacities. And sometimes I'm amazed when I see some of these collapses. Uh, you actually document very large rotation capacities. There are three or four, or sometimes six times what you would find in documents that today would say that no way uh, non-ductile concrete would have that rotation capacity. And here's another example. Finally, a few more slides from Guayaquil. This is the largest city. It's not the capital, but the largest city in, in, in the country, about 270 kilometers away. So very far away, uh, even for a very large magnitude earthquake like this one, you would not expect any damage at that distance. But as Roberto mentioned, it, it has some similar problems to Mexico City or even locally here in the Bay Area or Bay Mud of this uh, highly compressible uh, clay deposits that amplified I'll show you a little bit of this. This it's actually uh, from a thesis that Professor Pestaña knows very well. From this is the thesis of Professor Vera, who, who did his uh, PhD here, and is showing uh, with the different colors the, the predominant period of, of the site, and essentially where these deposits are deeper, you find longer periods there uh, in the dark red or, or the green. And, uh, and then areas where, where there's rock or shallow uh, soil deposits. The uh, stars represent three stations that recorded the, the earthquake, one of which up on the north of the city, it's on, located on a rock outcrop, and then two on the soft soil deposits. So I'll show you some interstory drift demands that we were computing in the last uh, few days. But before I show you just to you know, as an analogy of something that I teach my students here from just a few miles away, comparing the Yerba Buena Island and Treasure Island in the middle of the Bay Bridge, just how different the ground motion is. And we tend to think of the difference or the amplification of peak ground uh, acceleration, which in this case in the Loma Prieta earthquake was 2.7 times larger on, on, the, on, on Treasure Island, uh, but then if you look at spectral ordinates, that was almost four times larger. And code-wise, we sometimes oversimplify this problem, and, and we apply some velocity adjustment factors that go up to two, but clearly they're inadequate. A uh, clear example is, is the Mexico City, where the amplification of PGA would be about f somewhere between four and five, but then the spectral amplification uh, can reach values more like 12. And, and it's been written all over that, you know, the Mexico City clays, they're very special, more plastic, uh, higher water content, and because of that, they remain elastic for longer. But I'll show you some results from Guayaquil. Uh, again, comparing a record on rock on the green, and these are interstory or estimations of interstory drift demands on buildings with different periods. And, uh, and then on one of the soft sites, uh, in the same component, you see amplifications on the order of eight and a half times. So we clearly see that the side effects that, that uh, here at Berkeley, Professor, late Professor Seed devoted a lot of his life uh, studying this effect. I mean, it's a lot more complex that we often recognize in codes. And that's why uh, the code over there in the city requires uh, specific, site-specific studies for, for this uh, site class F sites. And this is another example um, where on the left, again, taken from Dr. Um, Vera's thesis, a soil profile 
just showing uh, shear wave velocities in the order of 120 meters per second, maybe going up to about 150, up to about 40 meters. And at that point, there's uh, some dense uh, sands, and then you go up to uh, 40. So it's that top 40 meters that it's strongly amplifying. And in this case, it's amplifying the interstory drift demands on a very narrow range of periods, but more than 15 times. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll just very quickly show you some of the things that, that we observe in Guayaquil. This is a collapse of an overpass that uh, I'm sure many of you saw in the news, where unfortunately one person was, was killed. And uh, in this case, the, the piers didn't have enough shear capacity, and they were sheared off by, by the earthquake. And these are, unfortunately, there's a number of similar viaducts in the city that they're now currently being studied, and they're going to be retrofitted. These are some of the images of, of the damage that took place on some of those. And, and this is the last thing I'll show you. This is a, an oncology hospital over there. Uh, Solka are the uh, initials of, uh, there you see in, in, in Spanish, the, the hospital against cancer. Uh, this is a sketch-up of this. This was fortunately retrofitted prior to the earthquake. And I believe the, the retrofit actually allowed this structure to avoid collapse. Uh, still, it had a number of non-structural damage, not of very large consequences. But yet, it's, it's an interesting reminder of how this flat slab structures, even under very low levels of drift, uh, they can experience very severe uh, problems. And uh, we documented problems, for example, in the emergency exits. And uh, this is a problem that we have worldwide. If you actually, as you walk out the, the door, just try to pay attention to the lock. But we just use the same locks everywhere. And they, this is what they tend to do during earthquakes. So in this case, they couldn't exit through that door. And this is some of the punching shear failure or incipient punching shear failure that took place in the structure and uh, some of that cracking. And, and this is just one of the more recent fancy buildings, uh, very nice architecture uh, in, in the new part of the city that also experienced some problems due to pounding. Uh, but I wonder, you know, if this was pounding from an earthquake 270 kilometers away, what will happen when the city of Guayaquil experiences a... a more closer earthquake. So just some final thoughts. The earthquakes continues to teach us that near source ground motions can be significantly more intense than we often estimate with our probabilistic seismic caster analysis. Uh, it clearly demonstrates the effects of, of uh, the, the importance of side effects. I mean, we saw it in Chone, in Manta, in Guayaquil, of course, and how not always codes do a good job in capturing the complexity of the, some of these effects. Uh, and I believe that even though we've made a lot of progress over the last 50 years, uh, there's still many aspects that we still don't understand, like those structures that they're neighboring, you know, very similar to see those soft stories and say, yeah, they collapse. But then you see others right next to them that have all the same problems, and they behave very well. And uh, and I think this, this earthquake, I mean, sort of the perhaps one of the most important lessons that I, that I came back with is that, that it's how painful reminder is of this very flexible structures. In particular, flexible structures. I myself lived through the uh, 1985 Mexico earthquake where more than 10,000 people lost their lives as a result of these flexible structures. We learned the lessons, and now they're more than two times stiffer than they used to. Uh, and I hope it's one of the lessons that, that the country works and start uh, doing structures that are more rigid, especially in combination with this uh, masonry infills. And, and finally, I want to remark that despite you know, all of the photographs that we show you, we witness a lot of structures that did very well, like that bridge, very good detailing by the uh, Ecuadorian engineers, uh, very good behavior, lots of bridges, and lots of structures that despite spectral ordinates that in some cases were three times larger than the code, they still managed to do uh, very well. So with that, we, we finish. 
thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, those of you who are um, on, on Internet, uh, you can send some uh, questions to that uh, email address. And while you're writing those, uh, we'll try to answer questions over here from the audience. Uh, one question from Quito. Mm -hmm. You could read that for us or translate because it's in Spanish. Okay. I can do that if you want and you answer that. So, so that, that first one is just to provide recommendations for the design of buildings from 10 to 15 stories on soft soils. Uh, well, that's a very tough one, but just to, to answer very quickly, Rainforest concrete walls do, do wonders in those situations, and, and we saw very few of those. So it's something that, that as a general recommendation, I, I would use more uh, concrete walls. Um, the, there's another question is that there are some waves that, that uh, travel uh, parallel to the coast of Ecuador, and, and why that happened. Well, you know, there are really waves propagating in all directions in many different kinds of waves. Uh, but there are these this clear things that, that Roberto talked about uh, of directivity or a little bit more intensity toward the south. And uh, that, you know, we don't know a lot of what triggers this, especially with subduction. Uh, with strike slip faults, it's a little bit more clear what, what creates this, this directivity effects. Uh, but they're very important. And especially we seem to uh, not properly account for this when we do probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And we saw that in terms of the damage that took place. For example, in the aftershock, there was more damage to the north in Esmeraldas than to the south. But the main event, it was more toward the south. There's a very clear, we didn't have time to show, a very clear difference in intensity at similar distances to the north or to the south. And uh, finally, that, that on the... On the Andes, on, on, on the mountains, there was not a lot of damage. Well, that, that's very far, and if you're on, on firm soil, uh, the, the motion was just 1% or 2% of G, so, so there was no damage there. Um, thank you very much. Uh, our time is up. It's 1.30. Uh, we need to close this session. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you to everyone here in the audience as well as all of you online.